Welcome to this session on the Age of Modernism. Age of Modernism, we're going to say, lasted from 1910 to about 1950. You'll notice that piece of art up there that's called Abstract Expressionism. This one done by Jackson Pollock, which I think is pretty iconic for this particular era. So the Age of Modernism saw the expansion and consolidation and kind of universalization of industrial output, industrial processes, basically the whole industrial orientation of Western society. It was also a time of unprecedented prosperity and scientific advancement. Yet it was also a time of horrendous wars. We'll talk about those in this session. It was a time of unstoppable social change and potentially disastrous technological power, especially the invention of nuclear power, nuclear weapons. So let's look at the situation in Europe in 1910. European nations were in competition for power, influence, and resources. The colonial empires were still spreading at this time. Some new nations were getting into the colonial game, namely Germany and Italy were latecomers to the colonial enterprise. So there was all sorts of competition there. Many countries were overdue for social and political reform, especially Russia. Industrial advances that had been made really in the latter part of the industrial materialist age had made warfare incredibly destructive, and I don't think the armies were ready for that. They didn't really fully anticipate how destructive warfare would be. And there came to be a complicated set of alliances that knit the European nations together on two different sides, the central powers and the allied powers. And it was just a recipe for World War. So let's jump right into World War I. You see this is a picture of some British soldiers that had been blinded by gas attack. And they're waiting for treatment, waiting for shipment home. And uh, it you know just typifies the horrendous not only death, but also maiming and injury that was uh, suffered by troops on all sides in this horrible war. I talked about the Allied powers. That was the British Commonwealth, including Great Britain, and all of its Commonwealth territories and countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, some of the uh, African colonies, and so forth. France and its possessions. France also had colonial satellites. Uh, such as some of the Polynesian countries like Tahiti, the Marquesas Islands, and some African countries like Senegal and um, other places, uh, Cameroon. And then Russia eventually came in on the side of the Allies. They needed it because they were all afraid of Germany. Germany was this brand new, very confident, very advanced nation. Remember, it had not been a nation before the 1870s. And so the unification of Germany was this new factor which everybody was afraid of because Germany was determined to gain po colonial possessions, determined to be a world power, finally. And so France and Russia and Britain decided that they all had a common uh, opposition, common foe, which would be the new Germany. And Italy joined on the side of the Allied powers in World War I. In World War II, they'd be on the side of Germany. And then the United States tried to stay neutral, but after 1917, they entered the war on the side of the Allies. Uh, the United States had been deeply divided over the issue of who to join during the first several years of the war or whether to join anybody at all. There, has been a, there had been a sizable German-American population that still spoke German, still had German cultural ways, and many of them were sympathetic with Germany. Remember, this is way before Hitler. This is before the Nazis. This is imperial Germany under the Kaiser. And so there was a lot of loyalty to Germany. Um, there were some who had wanted to join the Germans uh, as the United States. Others wanted to be pro-British. And so President Wilson wanted to stay out of it. But the sinking of the Lusitania, which was a British merchant ship, which had American passengers on it and had several American children who were drowned, the British uh, press took advantage of that, photographed the bodies of these American children that had drowned when the German U-boat sank the Lusitania. And of course, America <clears throat> rose to the occasion and immediately demanded that we go to war with Germany. Um, so 
the United States finally did enter the war in 1917. And it was surprising how quickly the United States could draft, train, provision, equip, and send troops. I think it was in, within a, six to nine months, there were troops called the American Expeditionary Force joining the British and the French uh, on the front lines in France. Up to that time, Germany had been slowly winning in the West. Germany had won in, uh, in the East. They had signed a separate peace treaty with Russia. They were able to move all of their forces from the East into the West, and they were beginning to crush the Allied powers until the United States arrived, and then the situation reversed. Central powers included Austria-Hungary, which was not only Austria, but Hungary, uh, what we would think of as Yugoslavia, Romania, places like that, to Serbia. Of course, Germany, uh, Turkey, and Bulgaria. So World War I, from 1914 to 1918, was called the War to End All Wars. And the, as I said, the progress of technology and industry had introduced many new factors to warfare, such as the airplane. Airplanes were first used in the war as uh, observers. They would fly over enemy lines and try to count troops and, you know, artillery pieces and supply depot and all of that. Uh, then pilots began taking up weapons to shoot at each other. Then weapons were mounted on the airplanes uh, to shoot down enemy observers. And eventually it became very sophisticated uh, it became a whole separate field of war, not just to shoot down observers, but to destroy the enemy aircraft. Eventually, bombers were introduced to bomb facilities, and so it was uh, it was an escalation that really had not been seen in warfare before that. Submarines were a new thing as well, and the Germans were way ahead of everybody else and were able to sink a lot of Allied shipping, including the Lusitania, which I had mentioned. They introduced poison gas. Germans appeared to do that first, but both sides used it. And of course, you're able to destroy a lot of troops without firing a single shot. They just inhale the gas and, and they die. The, if the gas gets in your lungs, it burns your lungs up. If it gets in your eyes, it, it blinds you. And so it was just, it was a terrible, terrible thing. I think there's a treaty now that says you can't use poison gas in war. I'm not sure who abides by the treaty, but I think there's one there. Machine gun allowed a crew of three or four guys to mow down dozens and dozens of enemies as they charged. So the infantry charge out in the open was a thing of the past. You just don't do that against machine guns. And of course, the tank was new. The tank was able to roll over infantry formations, even roll over trenches as long as the trenches weren't too wide. And um, I don't know how effective the tanks were, but they surely struck fear into the hearts of the infantry. And of course, the automobile and the truck were used to transport troops and supplies very quickly. That was a new thing as well. Trench warfare became the norm during most of the war because the highly destructive new weapons like the machine gun um, forced infantry to dig in for protection. So the only way to escape the relentless spray of machine gun bullets was simply to dig underground. And that's what they did. So from, from Holland to Switzerland, there was a parallel series of trenches occupied by the Germans on one side and the Allies, mainly the French and British, but then eventually the Americans on the other side. And uh, they faced each other for hundreds and hundreds of miles. In this picture, you see French troops, although they're colonial French troops, they're from Senegal, they're African troops wearing French uniforms. This, these systems of trenches are not very sophisticated. It must be early in the war, or maybe it's after an advance or something. But uh, trenches became very, very sophisticated. The results of the war are 10 million dead on both sides, so a total of 10 million. The Allies were victorious except for the Russians. The Russians had signed a separate peace treaty with Germany. Um, and the Allied powers were determined to blame Germany for the entire thing. Germany had to pay back all of the war debt, all of the expenses for the British and the French and some others. 
And uh, which, of course, what's that going to do to the German economy? The German economy is already on the verge of collapse because of their own spending for the war. And now they're being forced to pay for several other nations' war debts. President Wilson of the United States counseled the other allied powers not to do that. He said, you're, you're just going to have to fight these people again if, if you make them so resentful for blaming them for the whole thing. They weren't, they weren't responsible for the whole thing. Everybody was in it. Everybody had contributed to the starting of it. Germany had done some horrible things, but then so had the others. But the Allied leaders insisted. And so Germany ended up, ended up being devastated and feeling unjustly blamed, which resulted in um, German political reaction. Uh, you know, they, extreme political parties uh, came about in Germany, including communists who were trying to take over the entire government. The, uh, the, the Kaiser or the king abdicated and went to Holland. Um, other political parties rose to the power. Uh, eventually, uh, they had a republic set up called the Weimar Republic, but it was very ineffective, very uh, kind of powerless to do much. Inflation skyrocketed, causing severe economic depression. And then in the 1920s, a very extreme right-wing party rose called the National Socialists, eventually led by a former German corporal named Adolf Hitler. They rose to power because they were utterly ruthless towards their enemies, their, their opponents, and eventually took power within about a decade or so. They were in control of all of Germany. Many in political power mistakenly believed that, that war as such had become a thing of the past because World War I had been so horrible. I mean, how could anybody contemplate going through that again, no matter how angry you are at some other nation? You wouldn't want that to happen again. So many people naively believed that we're not going to have any more wars. We just proved that it was just too horrible to even think about. That was wrong, of course, but that's what some people thought. The United States became a recognized world power during this time, and suddenly the other nations of the world were taking the United States very seriously. We had been able to field a very sizable, effective army very quickly. Our industrial output was absolutely astounding to most of the other countries. They, they could not even contemplate how a nation could put out so many weapons and supplies and, and still have the economy at home just roaring. They're, they're, the United States, the, the people at home, really didn't suffer too much in terms of economic, you know, severity. And so uh, the United States became a recognized world power. And then Tsarist Russia, as I said, was defeated by the Germans. It collapsed into the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. Let's look at the Russian Revolution, or sometimes called the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. As Russia collapsed as an imperial power, having been defeated by Germany and signed a separate peace treaty with Germany, Russia descended into civil war and chaos. Uh, the Leninists, the Marxists, the communists, they were all called the Bolsheviks, uh, took over Russia very, very quickly. The Tsar and the Russian nobility were deposed. The Tsar and his family were imprisoned out in Siberia. Some of the other Russian nobility were killed or also imprisoned. Some escaped. And a communist socialist state known as the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, or the Soviet Union, replaced the Russian government. Uh, eventually, the Tsar's family was killed. They were taken down into a basement and all of them shot to death. Their bodies were then um, stripped, covered with sulfuric acid, especially on the faces, and then taken out into the woods and buried in a mass grave. Their bodies were discovered about, oh, I don't know, I guess around the turn of the 21st century, sometime in there, um, but except for two of them. Two of them were not found. Anastasia and young Alexander, the heir to the throne. So uh, that was kind of a tragic, very tragic um, happening. And the reason that, that the communists did that, besides just hating them, they did it because there was a movement among what they called the white Russians, meaning instead of the Reds, the Reds were the communists, so the whites were the czarists. 
And um, there was a, a huge movement of people wanting to bring the Tsar back and depose the Bolsheviks, get rid of them. And so to remove their symbol, remove the rallying point for these people, the Tsar and his family were murdered. The USSR was initially led by Vladimir Lenin, who was probably the focal point of the early revolution. He eventually died. His body is preserved. You can go to Moscow. It's in a glass case preserved by chemicals and gases. You can, you can see him today if you want. But after Lenin's death, eventually the power struggle brought Joseph Stalin to power. Joseph Stalin was a ruthless dictator. He wasn't Russian. He was from one of the satellite countries, Georgia. And uh, he was able to rule the USSR until, I believe, shortly after World War II. I can't remember when he died, but I think it might have been in the early 50s. Um, and so... Uh, Joseph Stalin consolidated Russia, tried to industrialize Russia very, very quickly. So Russia had not been very industrialized at World War I, but by World War II, they had really increased their industrial ability. Um, they had collectivized the farms. The nobility who owned all the land was deposed. The state took over all the land and uh, collectivized the farms, meaning that they had peasants working the farms for a wage. And, of course, their output wasn't very good because states generally don't manage things very efficiently. I don't care what government it is, but most, most governments don't do a, as good a job of management as private owners do. So it was a very inefficient system, but it was a very different system. And generally speaking, the peasants' standard of living improved somewhat. Obviously, the upper middle class and the nobility, their standard of living really deteriorated. The thing about communism, everybody is equal, and if, if the standard of living is kind of low, then everybody's kind of low. In other countries, the opposite happened. In Italy, you had the rise of fascism. Fascism is sort of like a nationalism in which the government controls a lot of, a lot of things, but it's not communist. There's still private industry, um, but the government has a lot more control. In Italy, Benito Mussolini took over the government, made it a fascist country and uh, told the Italians that they were a destined people and that they needed to have an empire, which they eventually got. They took Tunisia as a, as a colony, and then they tried to take Ethiopia, but they were a little bit too um, overextended for that and got beat by the Ethiopians with their spears and primitive weapons, and the Italians just couldn't quite manage it. In Spain, Francisco Franco defeated the Spanish socialists and set up a fascist country in Spain. He died in the 1970s. I can remember as a young man when he died. And he brought in the king. He brought back the king, Juan Carlos II. But they have a Republican government now. Um, but Francisco Franco did much the same thing that had been done in Italy. By the way, when the uh, fascists were fighting the socialists in Spain, the Germans used their reconstructed military and air, air forces to battle the socialists and help the fascists in Spain. And so the German army had on-the-ground training with newer weapons, so that made them very much more advanced and ready for World War II than the other countries. Of course, Germany. And Adolf Hitler admired both Franco and Mussolini, and so he he led his Nazi party to power in Germany starting in 1933, I believe. He became chancellor and greatly began to rebuild the German army. Now, under the treaties of World War I, the Germans were limited as to the size of their army. and It had to be a very small army. Same thing with the Navy and the Air Force. So instead of openly doing it, he helped the nationalists in Spain. They got some on-the-ground training, as well as he shipped off young men to Russia. He had a separate peace treaty with Russia. And he trained young officers and soldiers and non-commissioned officers in Russia in training camps there off German soil. He had flying clubs in which they trained pilots for the Air Force, sailing clubs in which they trained uh, naval officers. So they were ready for World War II. Nobody else really was. In the East, uh, there was Japan. Japan wanted an empire as well. They believed that they were the nation to lead an Asian empire. And so they created something called the Greater Asian Co-Prosperity Sphere. 
And they invaded China in the 1930s, uh, occupied China and Korea, and began to gobble up resources. Their industry grew very, very quickly. They needed raw materials. Japan is not rich in raw materials, so they needed raw materials from Asia and other countries. And the United States began to recognize them as a threat. And so we began to restrict, like we were sending them scrap metal, we began to restrict the scrap metal we were sending them. We began to restrict the supplies of oil to them. And so this was a basically a, was a powder keg just waiting to go off. And so Japan realized that they were going to have to neutralize the United States if they were going to have this empire. And so uh, anyway, they began to make plans to do that. Germans and Italians began their territorial expansion. The Italians in Tunisia and parts of North Africa, the Germans began to consolidate German-speaking areas that were not part of Germany. There, was, there were German-speaking areas in Czechoslovakia that they annexed, um, and the British allowed that to happen, called the Sudetenland, the area bordering Germany and Czechoslovakia, they annexed. And then they also just annexed Austria itself, because Austria is German-speaking. So uh, Germany was beginning to expand. The British and the French made a treaty with Poland that if Germany crossed the Polish border, that would be an act of war, that they would all declare war on Germany. Now, Germany did do that in September of 1939. Why did they do that? Well, I think they did that because they wanted to expand their territory. But there were also large communities, settlements of Germans inside Poland. Now, you may not know this, but Poland was kind of an artificial country. It had been part of Prussia, North Germany. Prussia had had territories in what is now Poland. Russia had claimed Poland. So, I mean, the Polish people had always been there. The Polish language and culture had always been there. But as far as a stable nation, it had kind of gone back and forth. And so, consequently, inside the territory of Poland, there were large German settlements, which, according to Hitler, the, the Poles were persecuting. They were killing German civilians. They were, they were robbing them of their homes. German refugees were streaming across into Germany from Poland. I know some of that was clearly true. How much of it was true, I don't really know. But uh, certainly Hitler took it seriously and said, we're going to defend our people, and so therefore crossed the German border. Now, I, there was a lot of reasons for it. You know, it wasn't just to defend the poor, innocent German you know, refugees. But that was one factor in the whole situation. And so once the Germans crossed the Polish border, automatically Poland and Britain and France declared war on Germany. Also, there were unresolved issues and animosities from the horrors of World War I. Obviously, you know, the Germans were still angry that they had been blamed for the entire conflict and had to pay for the entire conflict. So there, were, there was that. But still, there, there was a lot of bad feeling in France against Germany and some of the things that the Germans had done. Same thing in Britain. And so there was, it was all, almost like a, you know, a prize fight in which one, one fighter had won, but they were demanding for a rematch. And kind of World War II was a rematch of World War I almost. Almost the same players. There was competition on the east, in the east, with Japan from Britain, France, and especially the United States for resources and influence in the Pacific. So the Pacific was seen as kind of up for grabs, and Japan wanted it all. Britain, France, and the United States wanted a piece of the pie. And obviously, some of the countries in Asia themselves wanted to be left alone, China and Korea especially, but also the French Indochina, which was a, you know, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, that was all. Uh, part of the French colonial orbit, and uh, they were wanting to be free from France as well. So there was a lot of factors going on. So the Allies, Britain and France, declared war on Germany in September, in September of 1939, after Germany invaded Poland. The German Lightning War, Blitzkrieg, overwhelmed France. So not only did they crush Poland in a matter of, I don't know, a couple of months, I think it was, but they they crushed France as well. France had this formidable defensive line on the German border, but the Germans didn't bother to 
deal with that. They just simply invaded through Belgium and Holland. They crushed Belgium and Holland in a matter of, I think, a couple of weeks. And they were across the border into France. And basically the French were not prepared. The British had sent a large expeditionary force into France. And they almost were gobbled up entirely by the German Lightning War. They were cornered at the port city of Dunkirk. And the Germans almost were able to just cause the surrender of almost the entire British fighting force, most of their army. But Churchill sent every boat that he could think of, every person with a sailboat, every person with a motorboat was sent to Dunkirk to bring the army off. And they got almost all of their army off and some of the French army off as well. And then Germany, having consolidated its uh, rule of Europe, uh, have ever made a mistake. They had a peace treaty with Russia, which they broke. They attacked the Soviet Union in the summer of 1941, which caused the Soviet Union to join the Allies. And of course, this was the downfall. Napoleon had tried to invade Russia and failed. Germany tried to invade Russia and failed. Russia is just way too big. It has too much space. There are too many Russians. And the, by this time, Russia was heavily industrialized, so they could put out tanks and weapons and so forth. So it was a a bad move on the part of Germany to do that. So the Allies, which meaning at this point Britain and France and Poland and some others declared war on Germany. Japan had signed a peace treaty with Germany early on, becoming part of the axis of power between Germany and Italy and Japan, and understanding that probably war with the United States was inevitable. They moved to neutralize the U.S. Navy in the Pacific on December 7, 1941. They attacked the Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor, destroyed many of our ships. Fortunately, they were not able to destroy the aircraft carriers, which were not there at the time. And a day or two later, the United States declared war on Japan, Germany, and Italy. Following suit, Britain and France declared war on Japan as well, because Japan wanted to take all of their possessions away, French Indochina, and in the case of the British, it would be Singapore and Hong Kong and other places that Britain had planted their flag. Well, World War II lasted in Europe from 1939 to 1945. As far as the United States was concerned, it lasted from December of 1941 until May of 1945. Germany was defeated in May of 1945, devastated by the bombers. Its industry was collapsed. Its money was devalued. It was divided into two countries, West Germany and East Germany. It was occupied by different powers. The Russians occupied East Germany. And for a few years anyway, the United States, Britain, and France divided up West Germany and occupied different portions of it. The USSR became a world power, finally. Suddenly they're on the stage as a world power with their sphere of influence, including all of Eastern Europe, all the way to East Germany. So that would be Poland, that would be Baltic countries like Lithuania, Estonia, Latvia, Ukraine, it would be Hungary, Romania. All of those countries became communist. Many nations under Soviet influence became communist and socialist as well, including um, there was a revolution in China a few years later uh, with the Chinese communists taking over in 1950. And then, of course, moving into Korea, causing the Korean conflict and resulting in a divided Korea, North and South. The results of World War II, the United States had and the Allies had defeated Germany conventionally in May, but the Japanese vowed to fight on to the last person, street by street. So the United States decided that instead of losing potentially a million American soldiers as well as you know, countless millions of Japanese, we would just nuke a couple of Japanese cities, which we did, and the Japanese promptly surrendered in September of 1945. But we weren't the only ones developing nuclear weapons. The The Soviets were also developing them alongside the British and the French. And so you have at least four nations in the late 1940s that had nuclear weapons. And eventually we realized that the Soviets were going to be our new adversaries, and so that caused missiles to be pointed from them to us and us to them. The British and other colonial empires began to break up. India split up and broke away from Britain. 
France lost its colonial empire in French Indochina, and the United States assumed the role of leadership of the free world. Communism began its worldwide spread. You can see the red area would be the communist areas. And then the world was divided into capitalist and socialist and neutral spheres. There were a few countries that kind of wanted to stay out of the orbits of one, of the, one or the other. In the 1960s, the communists staged a revolution in Cuba just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, which became a real bone of contention because now they were close to us, very close to us, and hostile. And in the 19, early 1960s, the Soviets showed signs that they were going to place nuclear missiles, which is basically like sneaking up behind somebody and putting a gun to their head. You know, when, when the missiles were in Russia, we would have some warning and could fire missiles in return. And that was a doctrine called the, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction, meaning that, yeah, you can, you can kill us, but we'll kill you too, so don't, don't even think about it. But in Cuba, the, the time, there wasn't enough response time for us to fire back. So basically, President Kennedy told them, you will not put missiles in Cuba or we will go to war. And the Russians actually backed down. All right, let's talk about the art coming out of this, the art and the music and the architecture, the humanities coming out of this. As I've said many times before, it is difficult to fully understand the humanities in any period, whether it's art or music or architecture or literature, if you don't understand the times in which they're being written. So understand that this period, 1910 to 1950, was a time of huge trauma on earth. They'd been through two world wars. They had seen the rise of communism. They had seen the rise of nuclear weapons. So naturally the art and the music and the architecture and the literature are going to reflect that to some degree. So modernist art is going to feature exploration of the abstract and pure form, meaning that they're going to try to take the human element out of the artwork. Why? Because people are bad. That was the conclusion that they came to, that, that you can't trust people. We're going to kill ourselves, either through war or through nuclear bombs or something. You, you know, all of this hope that, that Western civilization is going to come to some utopia was completely destroyed in the modernist period. We understood that our technology only made us able to kill each other more efficiently. You know, all of our in industrial output you know, wasn't harnessed for the public good necessarily. So let's take people out of the equation and just explore abstract forms and pure forms. So let's look at some of the modernist art. We'll begin with Duchamp, Boccioni, and Brancusi. Let's take each one of those for a moment. Duchamp is a good example of how a painter would take the human element out of their painting. This is called nude descending a staircase. All right. But there's no human form in there. It, you can see how it looks like a person walking down some stairs, kind of in a time lapse. But there's no human form. It's basically just indicating movement, but not a person. You might even see a face looking sideways there at the middle top. But that's very inhuman. Understand, they're trying to take humanity out of the arts. Why? Because they don't trust humanity. Humanity's done some bad things, according to them. And, of course, that's true. Here's another example. Same thing. A human-like figure, but not really human. That's Baccioni. Unique forms of continuity in space. Here's another example. Bird in space by Brancusi. That has nothing to do with a bird. And now we're getting into not only taking the human out, but taking language out and deconstructing language, meaning that, that words don't have any particular meaning. I can call any object any word I want. So if I want to call that thing a bird, it looks more like a feather, but it's kind of a rounded, semi-tubular object. If I want to call that bird in space, I can, because language doesn't mean anything. So again, they're trying to, under, they're trying to say, all of our civilization doesn't amount to anything. It's, it's all meaningless, which is kind of depressing. But that's where they came to in this period. We'll take a look at how modernist art was used in the creation of what we call mass society. Mass society meaning trying to get 
the mass of a nation or a group of people all on the same page working for the same goals. So World War II was a good example of that. You see that communists, as well as fascists, everybody, even the United States, put together artwork that was to inspire people to get behind the war effort, to support what the country was doing. <coughs> Bottom left, you see a brave Russian soldier and the brave Russian nurse rushing into battle to save the motherland under the banner of communism. The bottom right, you see Nazi art. This is the, the master race, you know, the Aryan race, according to the Nazis. And they're superior, and they don't have to listen to anybody else. And that was supposed to inspire the Germans to a greater effort. But the United States did it, too, with art forms. So modernist art used um, radio um, in terms of radio broadcasts and shows. Um, they used the addresses by the President of the United States and others to comfort the people and inspire the people. They used film. They made films. Newspapers and other printed publications did the same thing. The arts, as we've just seen, as well as grand displays of national pride and power. Hitler was probably best at this in producing huge rallies with banners and bands and military uniforms and packing thousands of people into stadiums shoulder to shoulder and, and then giving them a grand speech about how they were all going to achieve their goals. And um, it's quite effective, really, in many ways. So this is the creation of mass society. We still see it going on today. That's one of the functions of the news media. The news media has been, in many ways, very unguarded about tr trying to create mass society. They believe that they can create public opinion. Advertisers do it. You know, they're trying to get you to buy their product. And, you know, I think, for example, Coca-Cola has been extremely successful in creating mass society. They do that by telling you that Coke is the greatest thing you've ever consumed in your life and you ought to have more of it and so on. More modernist art. As we, we started out with some of the works that we've already looked at, you see that they're trying to take the human form out of art. Well, here's more continuation of that. In Brach, on the extreme upper right, it's called the Portuguese. Well, there's nothing particularly Portuguese I can see about it. It's just shapes and forms and colors. But again, he's saying... Words don't have any meaning. If I want to call that Portuguese, I can do that. And then, of course, Picasso, you see his snapshot of him down in the lower left. He's trying to portray a three-dimensional figure in two dimensions there. That's why you've got eyes, but then the nose is in a different position. Um, and so he was very famous for that. And then in the lower right, you've got his depiction of the Battle of Guernica, where Germans, I believe, bombed Guernica, which was a, an outpost of the socialists in the Basque country, and he's depicting the horrors of being bombed. Primitivism. Um, Picasso dabbled in that as well. In the far right is the picture called Le Demoiselle de Avignon, which is basically a portrayal of what a person might see when you visit a house of prostitution. Uh, apparently, the girls are brought out. You can choose the one you want. And so he was trying to depict that it's a primitive experience there, as depicted in the kind of the, the dehumanization of the, of the women, but also the masks that some of them are wearing and the odd poses that they're in. So that's uh, primitivism, but also Nolda, still life in masks, thinking that maybe uh, cultures in Africa or South America that use masks in their religious ceremonies, maybe they're more in tune with the real human condition than the West is because of their despair at what had happened to Western civilization. Expressionism and the fauves. Well, let's look at the fauves first. Fauve in French means wild beast. And so they were called that because of their wild use of colors. You know, the, the colors aren't very subtle. They're very bright. They're very contrasting. And this is Matisse's The Blue Window. Again, the, the to me, it looks like something that a sixth grader would do. But I think that's deliberate. I don't, I don't think Matisse was an amateur. I think he was deliberately saying, I want to do something primitive and out of the ordinary, using color and form. This is Kandinsky, Improvisation 28. No human figure. 
no recognizable figures of any kind. No trees, no flowers. I guess you could say some of that might look like a flower, but it's all just a, it's a bold use of colors and lines and forms and shape. And what the Fauves are trying to do is they're trying to make you feel something. Klee is all around the fish again. Fauvism, just an experimentation in color and doesn't necessarily have a meaning. It's odd shapes around a fish on a plate. This is Expressionism. Mark, deer in the woods. You can see the deer figures in the painting, but it's almost deconstructed. It's basically broken down into forms and shapes. It gives you the idea of deer lying down in the forest, but it's not really realistic, nor is it meant to be. And so Expressionism is all about getting you to feel the thing, almost like the Impressionists were doing to feel what they were trying to paint. Now there's anti-art and Dada. This is Duchamp on the left. Duchamp is famous for painting a pretty realistic reproduction of the Mona Lisa, so you can tell his technique was very good. He was very, a very skilled painter, but then he paints a mustache on her, basically saying, this is what I think of, of, your, of your great classic pieces of art. I'll just draw a mustache on it. I will deface the Mona Lisa. This is what I think of Western art and Western civilization. So it was anti-art. And then perhaps a, a, the best example of anti-art was somebody who said, you know what? Art is whatever I say it, it is. Beauty is whatever I say it is. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So I say the urinal is beautiful, and so I'm going to post that as a work of art. And that was actually posted in a museum, and people were supposed to look at that and go, what a wonderful, beautiful piece of art. But again, they were saying that the conventional ideas of beauty and something worth looking at, I'm just going to destroy that. I'm going to go outside that and do something very outlandish to make the point that Western civilization doesn't know what it's doing. <clears throat> surrealism, surrealism. You'll see in the book there's a picture by Chirico, which is called The Mystery and Melancholy of a Street in which a little in which you see the shadow of a little girl playing in the street, and then around the corner is coming a dark, menacing figure. It's supposed to make you feel tense, anxious, afraid, um, all of that. Magritte, the key of dreams, in which you have four pictures. I think there's a horse, there's a suitcase, there's a couple of other pictures. You'll see it in the textbook. But the names are all different. The, 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 he doesn't give them their correct names or their correct words go with that go with that basically saying language has no real meaning i can assign whatever word i want to whatever object i want and then here you see in this picture dolly's persistence of memory which there are some forms in there time seems to be melting ants are coming out of a watch and there's this figure on the beach that doesn't seem to be anything i can quite pinpoint but it basically is telling you that, that maybe our perception of time is meaningless and our perception of meaning and beauty is meaningless. A couple of others. Hopper doing the Nighthawks. You see here a city that's deserted. It doesn't seem to have any life going on. This probably is in the middle of the night. And you've got four figures inside a cafe, none of them talking to each other, all of them seemingly isolated and alone. Again, it's supposed to make you feel lonely. And then Rivera, famous Mexican muralist, who painted many kinds of murals, but these feature the enslavement of the Indians by the Spaniards and the Criollos, the native, the, the Spaniards born in Mexico, who dominated the other parts of society. And uh, really a social commentary that on the history of Mexico and really the wrongs that were done. Modernist architecture would be shown in architects like William Van Allen, who created the Chrysler Building. This is a skyscraper that you typically see in a large city. Uh, the top is kind of interesting, but really it's just a steel box with glass and concrete and you know other kinds of things. But it, it's basically a steel box that is embellished on top. And so again, it's it's not very human. It, it simply is a form that has been made to look acceptable and interesting. So again, dehumanization.
Frank Lloyd Wright and other architects stressed a harmony of the structure with its surroundings. For example, falling water. That was Frank Lloyd Wright. This was designed for someone in southwestern Pennsylvania in the mountains area. And you can see he's there's a series of waterfalls that he's incorporated this house into. So the terraces in the house almost look like they're part of the landscape. Very, very interesting, very great idea. He did a number of those things. For a number of years, my father was a professor at Arizona State University, and Frank Lloyd Wright designed one of their great auditoriums there called the Grady Gamage Auditorium, and it's designed to look just like the sandy red hills around the area where Arizona State is located. So he was very innovative in that way. Theater and dance featured modern themes, techniques, and forms of expression. So diff experiments with costuming, experiments with dance forms, experiments with music, experiments with lighting and stage, and even the type of play that would be put on. Sometimes they would do theater in the round, meaning that people would be sitting all around the actors and that the actors wouldn't be up on a stage in front of people. So lots of experimentation with theater and dance. In music, Stravinsky is maybe the best example of polyrhythms and polytonality. It's a very, I would call it, chaotic piece of music, Rite of Spring. But it's a very new approach to music that was tried at this time. And again, the idea being that our ideas of beauty need to be challenged. What, what is harmonious? What's melodious? What sounds good? Needs to be challenged. African Americans were coming up with their own music, jazz and blues, which um, didn't really challenge so much the idea of beauty, but just provided a concept of beauty that's coming from that culture, jazz and blues. So the modern period, in summary, featured an array of movements causing major changes in Western civilization, almost a, a despair over Western civilization, and this happened during the early 20th century. The period encouraged the re-examination of many aspects of society with the goal of identifying hindrances to progress and replacing them with perhaps new and better ways of achieving human goals, and in some artists, just despair that progress could ever be made. We'll see that this is going to continue and even intensify with uh, some redeeming qualities in the final period, the contemporary era.